Hi, I'm Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, welcome everybody to West Point, Mississippi, to the Gamekeeper Studio. And uh, boy, it's raining outside. It's, it's an ugly it day. There. I'm yeah. surprised our internet's working. It, well, I don't know that it is working. Uh, I hadn't done anything. The power's on. We know that. That's all we know. But I'll tell you this: we're going to get right down to it this morning. And we've got Mike, Doctor Mike Chamberlain, the Wild Turkey Doc. The Wild Turkey. There. Hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> The sound guy is on is on today. He is in the studio sitting in the chair between the turkeys. Yeah. And we're proud to have him. And uh, we're going to talk, we're going to find out, uh, we got a lot of questions to ask him. Yeah, I hope we don't ask him too many questions. He might not ever come back. You know, because it's like our favorite subject. Well, you know, I think he likes this part of the world. I think he got it, you know, let, let's go to him. Why are we talking to him? Why are you talking to me? But, <laughs> welcome, Dr. Mike Chamberlain. Welcome to, uh, we're so proud to have you here in the studio. I'm glad to be here, guys. It's good to visit with you. Yeah. Sure. Well, you, like I said, you know, you sounded a little taller on the radio. <laughs> now now yeah. to see you Sheriff in person. Sheriff Justice. Yeah. 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 You get that. I'm best, glad. Oh, best movie of all time. It no doubt good. about it. Yeah. yeah. He's bowing Uh-oh. down. Yeah. Here. So that's Lanny's book, we go. bookie calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every exactly. episode, his book. I'll call you back, calling. Jess. Sorry. <laughs> so. So look, what we wanted to do, we got a few minutes here. Uh, we've got a lot to, to, that we're going to try to do today. But uh, I understand you're uh, you're going after the Grand Slam this year, and you've got Osceola in the bag so far. What's next? Rio's, hopefully. I'm scheduled to go to Texas for a few days at the end of this week. And fingers crossed, you know, that the yeah. weather and every, the gods will cooperate and the stars will line up and... Then it's Easterns, you know, as I can hunt around my house, and, and then it's it's Merriam's, and then I'll either be divorced or, yeah. <laughs> or I'll be in pretty good shape. You know? There you go. Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to chase the Merriam? South Dakota, Nebraska. Oh, that's yeah. a great spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I love going out in that part of the world where you can see, you know, I get kind of claustrophobic around parts it of the southeast. It is to be able to see. So, yeah, I love to be able to see. Yeah. And people in that part of the world are are unique and they're different mm-hmm. and I enjoy visiting with them. Boy, speaking of being able to see, like where Lanny and I turkey hunt, it's about the time you see him is about when you get to kill him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no question yeah. about it's, it. I mean, it's yeah. it's way different than out there. Yeah, something kind of visceral about watching them from a distance and that's one of the great allowing things about your, Allowing yourself to calm down a little bit. You know, yeah, well, and you can there. learn a lot too because you visually get to see how he responds to your call. Sure. Sure. That's a really good lesson. Yeah, instead, of, instead of just hoping he shows up, yeah. That's exactly what happens with us. Well, I think I know what he's doing the whole time when I can't see him anyway. Well, I mean, in my mind, I see what he's doing, but I hope he's doing. You know, you never know. That's for sure. Fine. So, Perfect. look, let us let us ask a few questions. So, we're all fans of your uh, the, the Turkey Tuesdays. And if any, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this is probably following at Wild Turkey Doc on Instagram. It's some really good information if you're not. But... How did you become so passionate about wild turkeys? Yeah, I, I actually I grew up in Central Virginia, and at the time, you know, turkey hunting was popular, but it was it was spring and fall hunting were kind of split as far as popularity. We we fall hunted a lot, um, and I I got an opportunity to go to, to go to Virginia Tech, and I did my undergraduate degree there, and chase turkeys a little bit in the mountains of Virginia, but then was offered an opportunity to come here to Mississippi and as a graduate student at, at Mississippi State. And I actually had, it was interesting, I had three choices for projects. So basically the, the, the professor called me and he said, hey, you're our top guy. You're the, you're the guy that, you know, we're going to give you the pick of the three projects. One of them was a, a wood duck project. Well, wood ducks are cool. One was a fox squirrel project, and I was like, well, fox squirrels are cool. And the last was a turkey project. And I thought, no, nah, I'm, I'm going with a big bird here, you know. So that's literally how it started. I was I came here and, and was shipped down to Twin Oaks Wildlife Management Area, was given a couple of rocket nets and said, go for it, buddy. 
trap some birds and figure it out, put some trackers on them and get us data. And that was it. That was a spark. Trying to figure out how to catch this bird and, and study it, I became infatuated with their behavior because it was so difficult to catch them. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was, sure. I was a rookie and um, – and that's a tough place to work. If you, if you, and then you, you guys have you spent time in the Delta. That's <laughs> yeah. a tough place to work. It's a tough place to, to to do research, and the field conditions can be pretty pretty brutal. Yeah, with the water and the bugs and the mud, and it, it's tough. And I I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the Delta. I fell in love with Delta National Forest and Twin Oaks and all the places I was able to go. And I fell in love with turkeys because it was so difficult. It was such a challenge to do my job. Sure. And then I was fortunate enough to stay on to do a PhD degree studying turkeys at Tallahalla Wildlife Management Area. So I've studied turkeys all over this state in every different habitat type you can think of. And, and that was that was the spark that kind of lit it for me. And I was just fortunate. You know, I'd, I wasn't the brightest guy that there was, but I worked really hard. And when I left here, I was a, I walked right into a – a faculty position at LSU and and the agency to their credit there said we want to do some turkey work and we know you can do it so we're going to give you a little bit of money and let's see how you pan out and I was able to start studying turkeys in the same kind of habitats there the delta you know where I cut my teeth and and that was it from there I've just ridden the wave of being able to study this bird ever since so are there things that you have learned in your research that you've been able to apply as a turkey hunter that's made you a, a better turkey hunter? I mean, specific things that a normal guy might, might, might not think about? Oh, absolutely. The big one is patience. Um, the more I've studied this bird and the more I look at their behavior, when I say look, the more I infer their behavior from the, the type of telemetry data and the things that we collect, the more I realize that this bird sometimes has an agenda that doesn't include us. I say this a lot to people. And we try to push the agenda. And if you just slow down a little bit and realize he, he heard you, just settle back. And sometimes, you, you know, Dale Earnhardt used to say, sometimes you have to slow down and go fast. And that's true, in, in my opinion, in turkey hunting. Sometimes it's better to just be patient and let this bird go about their routine and they'll circle back to you sometimes when when you're drinking coffee at the corner store, he's there looking for where you were three hours ago. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I've learned is to be be more patient. I've also learned not to call so loud, but I have a hard time not doing it. Because I <laughs> really like them gobble. Yeah, I really like to. Listen to that, Lanny. Pay attention. Yeah. 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 Hey, you pay talk pay about attention to me. And patience. <laughs> no, that's tough in this office. It yeah. Is. Yeah, I yell a lot more in the office than I do in the woods. <laughs> no, but the loud part is what I'm yeah. is what I'm referring to. Yeah, I call too loud. I know I do. Yeah, and I'm I own it. It's okay. It's fine. I'm fine with it. You know, I try not to. Says he who only yelps with a box call over there. But I can get soft when I need to. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I, I would just imagine that as you've traveled around studying these birds that. That, that there's probably things that aggravate you and frustrate you and disappoint you in the way that some, not necessarily that the states are running. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, uh, from a from a legal or, or mm -hmm. how things are done, but just the way certain groups of people respond to. I, I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I've always heard rumors that after guys would go in and try to ban turkeys or whatever, that all the locals, they would really descend upon that population of turkeys trying to kill a ban. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's kind, of, that's kind of, that doesn't help your research at all for right. somebody to do that. And I, that's got to be aggravating for, do y'all keep these things under wraps or under, be secretive about it? No, I mean, people find out about where we're banning birds and where we're trapping. And honestly, guys, I mean, we're, we're, we're banning birds trying to understand what their harvest rates are. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of it kind of comes with the territory. You, you start focusing attention on a study site or something that you're doing because you want people to know what's going on because you want them to appreciate and value the fact that it's being done and it's being done to benefit the resource that we all collectively value. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that comes with, some side effects that aren't always positive. You, you, like you say, Bobby, you, you do get some 
unwanted attention. You get you, you get some people that would otherwise focus activities elsewhere that may come try to, you know, to hunt in that area. But I, we don't really worry about that. We just try to catch as many birds as we can, and and we try to do the best job we can because we want the agencies to get the best product that they can get so that they can turn around and provide us with the most sustainable management scenarios that, you know, right. make sure we have this bird in the future. I like how you said us because the way – what I'm thinking that you're meaning is we as turkey hunters. Yes. And you're including yourself in that. Oh, so So it, it feels like your mission is to try to give whatever agency needs the information – the best information they can have to make decisions. And I, I don't know that I've really realized how important all that is until lately as there's been so much discussion about turkey seasons. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it's so complicated. Oh, yeah. And, and when I hear people talk about, well, Alabama's going to move theirs back a few days, well, then that's going to impact the, the edge of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I mean, are more people then going to go to those first five days over in Mississippi mm -hmm. and kill more birds than they normally do? Mm -hmm. it's, it is really complicated to figure this thing out. It is. And, and agencies are walking a tightrope because they – and I, I'm speaking as an outsider. I'm, I don't work for an, an agency, a state agency like, you know, wildlife fisheries and parks or whatever – but they, they really are walking a tightrope. They're, they're trying to make sure that we're satisfied, that us turkey hunters are satisfied. And, and what satisfies us is to hear birds gobble and to be able to chase them. Opportunity and gobbling, that's what, that's what we want. The harvest is kind of secondary. Hunter surveys have shown that, that the primary determinant is I want to hear birds. And I think, mm -hmm. I think we'd all agree. If I go out and hear a bird and particularly get to work a bird, I'm happy going home empty-handed. Yeah, and sometimes getting my tail kicked is... Sure. Ha even if you miss. Yeah. Had a hunt. That's yeah. what yeah. you want to have. Just have a hunt. Yeah, but the, but the agencies are... They're in a tricky situation because they, they're they they're on this fence that... On one side of the fence, they have turkey hunters who are paying the bills. They're the economic driver of management in the, in the state. And on the flip side of the fence, they have this resource that they... They want to make sure sustainable in the future. And they need us to be out there afield. They need us to buy a license. They need us to put gas in our vehicles. They need us to buy a turkey hunting vest. They need those mm -hmm. things. On the other side, they need that resource to be sustainable so we'll continue to do that activity. And in many situations, agencies look at, at harvest and seasons as a way of trying to to thread that needle, if you will. And it is a tricky situation because, as you mentioned, Bobby, you have hunters. I mean, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. I travel all over the place, you know, to hunt turkeys. And so when one state changes a regulation, it has a cascading effect on other states and other people's behavior, sometimes many, many states away because people that are passionate about doing this activity, they plan their entire spring. I mean, I've been planning my spring since last spring. Sure. You know, trying to figure out, hey, where can I go and who can I meet and what cool birds can I see on places I've never been? And and a lot of us do that. So when the state makes a change, well, now it just changes our behavior. So right. the agencies are – I. I I appreciate what agencies deal with, and I have some very close friends that are in the trenches with this stuff, and it is a frustrating kind of situation for them to be in because they do want us to be out there, and they do want us to be satisfied, but they also are, are looking down the road and saying, well, you know, where are we going to be in five years or ten years? And I don't envy that job. No, that's sure. a delicate, delicate uh, balancing act for sure. It's the, you know, we've talked about the yin and yang of conservation and hunting and how it has to go together. You know? Yeah. They can't, neither one can exist without the other one. So, Dudley, you, you, have you got a question? No, I was, I was just going to say that change can be tough, whether that be for the hunter, you know, the, the public, or the, or the people that are managing all of this and making yeah. the decisions. Yeah, we often mistake our agencies as the game wardens, you know, but we don't know what they're really doing behind the scenes is trying to get the best data possible to help make the best policies and decisions for the resource overall. So yeah. hugely yeah. important. So yeah. kudos for getting us the best data possible. Well, and 
Because Bobby and I, we just out here hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and history plays such a role in this because it, historically the the game and fish departments just do what they did last year, and they did that because that's what they did the year before, and it right. just we just continue down the road of doing the same thing. Well, and the the other thing that a lot of people don't that don't realize, and it's not their fault. They just they they're not aware of it. You know, science isn't absolute. It, it's mm-hmm. so you provide an agency with a product. Maybe it takes us five years to study this particular population on these properties. And then we provide the agency with a product. Well, that turkey population may not function like turkey populations in another part of the world. Well, you give the agency the best product that you can. And in some situations, they they use it and they make a change. And in other situations, the, the science just doesn't become as clean as you would like it. And and what I mean by that is there's noise. There's noise in every piece of data that you provide somebody. So in my case, for instance, I'll give a state agency a a product, and I'm almost always satisfied with it because I have good people that work with me and they, they do a good job. But I always acknowledge that, you know, this is the answer I'm giving you based on this five years of information. But... This is not an absolute truth. We're working in shades of gray here, and so are the agencies. They're working in shades of gray, understanding that that things change, and all you have to do is drive around this landscape and see what's out your windshield to realize things are a lot different than they were 15 or 20 years ago. And in some areas, from one year to the next, you know, you, you can just see how the local turkey population would be affected by what's ongoing. Agencies are trying to manage across an entire state, not on your back 40 or on on that WMA. I mean, they're trying to manage a very broad area, and that's a that's a challenge. Yeah, and even the 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 spatial aspect of it. I mean, the turkey doesn't know where the state line is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, So, Doc, we've got. Mac Thatcher, I don't. I think you got to meet him earlier. He's the most inquisitive person I've ever met, <laughs> and he has just been tugging at my leg, saying he had a bunch of questions. Mac, I'm gonna give you a chance. Here's your here's your opportunity. Drum roll. Mac, would you quit texting? <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get his questions right. Now, is, are you gonna use the bullhorn here? Absolutely. Okay, okay. That's, we're, we're, that's we're behind, behind the glass. glass. Okay, behind yeah. the glass. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Cheap productions, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the most interesting things uh, from a lot of the data that you share via social media and just talking around the office is kind of watching the travel patterns of the birds and, and you know how they'll find you know maybe transition lines and things like that. And does that vary? Because I know the topography is a lot different, say, like in the Mississippi Delta Mm -hmm. and the Delta, Louisiana, versus the hills up here and the prairie. So do you see the patterns of turkeys? Are they traveling the same distances in different topography or in the swamps where they might, you know, have a shorter range or versus in the prairie and things like that? Yeah, no, we see dramatic differences in movements. And it it varies – and this, this may sound like kind of a cop-out answer, but it depends. Um, every bird is different. So when they're, in these, when they're in bigger flocks, it tends to be very consistent because you have a group of birds that's being led, if you will, by several dominant birds in that group, and they, they are more predictable. But once you get to where we are right now in the, in the season, all bets are off. We'll have situations where – a particular tom may literally only cover 300 meters, 300 yards in a day. Like he'll just go back and forth in the same spot. And then the next tom will move five times that that distance in a day. We had situations on some sites that were very rugged, but think like, uh, you know, northeast kind of part of Mississippi where you're starting to get into some terrain, North Alabama, hilly where these birds would not cover much ground in the day because the topography allowed them to not have to move much as long as they had forage. They weren't disturbed. They could kind of hang hang out. The bottom line is turkeys, like every other critter, they're, they're trying to move as, le- as little as possible and gain as much energy as they can. The more they move, the more susceptible they are to die. 
and the more energy they burn. So they're trying to not move far unless, now again, with Tom's, it's all bets are off. If he thinks that he may secure a breeding opportunity, he may go on a walkabout, but we don't see that with him. Secure a breeding opportunity. That's, that's, that's a good way to do that. Right? Yeah, that that's, the, <laughs> that's the technical, yeah, the technical <laughs> science jargon. Yeah. I had to write yeah. that one out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, don't use it with your significant other because I can assure you it falls on. <laughs> drop an outlook just, appointment in there. Yeah, it's, it's just a deadpan drop. Yep. Yeah, doesn't okay. help at all. Yep, doesn't help at all. I'll, I'll take your advice on that. <laughs> oh, oh man. man, that's a good question, Mike. Well, thanks. Yeah. I've so, got a long list of other ones. Too, well, let's but. give him a break. Would you call <laughs> and you go back to texting if you need to? But look, so the one of the questions. I, all my life, I've heard the old timers talk about how the 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 you know we don't use the word tom around here. We for mm-hmm. some reason we just don't like that word. But mm-hmm. I've always heard that a, a long bearded, uh, a, a, if you will, a tom would Ooh. if he found a nest, <laughs> he weird. would bust up the nest. You know, step yeah. on the. Ed- is there any truth to that, or is that just no. kind of a misnomer? That's a wives' tale. Yeah, that's a wives. Well, well, I missed out on this. We got to go. Rehash yeah, this again. Well, so I've always been told that that uh, that a that a tom, if he a long I, beard, yeah, a long beard, if he found a nest, that he would destroy the egg so that hen would have to start all over again. What? I, I've really, uh, am I, I mean, I've been oh, told I'm, that. And, I get and secure another breeding it's, opportunity. That, that's exactly, exactly. Right. <laughs> Dudley. That's the scene. <laughs> he went to the cold exactly. Playboy school. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, if you've heard this, haven't you? Oh, I have. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And hmm. I and I every time I. And there may be somebody out there listening that is right now is thinking about, like, how to torch me on this. But I've always <laughs> answered this by saying, if you have photographic video evidence of that, send it to me. And I'll file it right there with the Black Panther videos that I have. I, and I take that. Don't, don't start that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'll you with that one. Yeah, don't, don't start that. Yeah, it was yeah. a Jaguar. It was not yeah. a Panther. <laughs> but no, no, there's no evidence to suggest that they would do that. And the bottom line is, what we see with our with our, I'll, I'll just use long beards for your sake. Okay. We'll, go, we'll go down that road, and not say Tom's. Those those males, they don't hang out in areas where hens are putting a nest. In other words, hens are selecting in most cases sites that they can hide, at least hide in. And Tom's, are, sorry. Long beards <laughs> are not going to those spots. They're hanging out in other places. So this notion that, you know, there's this guy running around in the woods stomping nest is, no. Yeah, and even, I mean, like, as a species, they're, you know, designed genetically to procreate. And, sure. I'm telling you, I've heard people tell me this, though. That, okay. that, that, that oh, that I've heard it thing. many times. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, hmm. you just missed it, Lanny. You just I, haven't I been just, around the uneducated like I have oh, that, that have explained that. And there are species that do that. There are species where males will kill Offspring, lions, yeah, bears. In order to yeah. breed again, yeah. So well, I, I think a rough world out there. It, it yeah. really, it's a dog eat dog world. <laughs> but but turkeys aren't aren't that bird. Yeah. So I've got another, and I don't mean to hog the questions, but I have so <laughs> many. Okay, that, you that. know, Mac, we'll get you back in here. Mac, quit texting, please. <laughs> so it, I've <laughs> always <laughs> wondered during this breeding cycle, and the hen is she's figured out she she's found a nest, and she'll she's going to go and lay that first egg. When she lays that egg, that night, does she roost in a tree? Yes. And then she comes back down and she'll lay a second egg the next day. And then she does her business and then goes up in a tree. But at some point, she's laid all her... Would you explain how that works when she... Please. Yeah, so what they do is they actually... Once they realize physiologically, I'm about to start laying a clutch. They What we see with our spatial data is... She will spend most of her day somewhere else away from that that nest. And then about once each day, she will go over to that nest, typically doesn't spend much time there at all. She lays an egg and she leaves. And she goes and roosts somewhere away from that spot. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Don't draw attention mm-hmm. to that spot. Mm-hmm. So as she gets closer to being ready to start incubating, so let's... We'll use this scenario. Her her nest eventually has 10 eggs in it. Once she starts getting to about egg six or seven, she starts hanging around the nest a little more. She'll actually incubate for a few minutes here and there and then leave. 
but she's still roosting away from the nest in a tree. And then suddenly on that, whatever that magic day is, when her body says it's time to start sitting, she starts continuously incubating in most cases. And what I mean by that is some hens we will see, they'll spend every waking moment on the nest from day one. They'll sleep there, you know, they'll sit there at night and they'll sit all day and they'll maybe leave once a day and forage and, and do their business for a little while and they'll come back. And we see some hens that actually roost away from the nest, even though they're incubating during the day, hmm. they'll go roost at night for the first couple of days. Almost, it, and I'm kind of personifying a turkey trying to get in their head. I, it's almost like, ah, man, I really don't want to sit there tonight. I know I should. Mm -hmm. I stayed here all day, but I'm a lot safer in that tree. So I'll go a couple hundred yards away and go roost over there. But after a, a couple of days, I think their instinct is, no, I need to be on that, that nest all, all night too. Right. And then they sit continuously. Uh, um, We've a, talked about that a lot. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a chicken owner, and uh, I, I look at what they do and sometimes think mm -hmm. about, well, maybe a turkey does – you know, has some of those habits too. I know when a when a hen, my pet chicken, uh, start. You know, they lay eggs every day, but about once a year they do what's called going broody, mm -hmm. and they all it's almost like they're mean. And uh, you get close, they'll rough their feathers out. Uh, they don't want to eat. Uh, you physically have to pick them up off the eggs and move them to mm -hmm. to eat and drink. So I'm, I'm assuming a hen may kind of take on a, a broodiness. Uh, it, maybe it's not as noticeable. It's but, not. Uh, because in, And the problem, Dudley, is, you know, we're not, we're not able to watch the birds. Sure. You know? we're, we're inferring what they're doing based on their, these GPS locations we get. But we do see that hens have different personalities, if you will, in regards to how they nest, how they behave when they nest. Some seem to really prioritize their own survival. They spend a lot of time away from the nest, and some are just glued to that nest right. to the point where that it often kills them. And, and we tend to see that the birds that spend more time at the nest, they have higher success. They're more successful. They're better, but they die. Hmm. They, they have a, a decreased survival. So there are, to your point, there are, at least inferring from what we see with the spatial data, there, there are different types of hens, and some are much more cued into that nest than others. Okay. So as a hen gets older, has she become a better mother? Had, she's had success a couple of times. She's got a, ch a better chance at having success in the future? Yeah, yeah. What we tend to see, and this is something that's really interesting to me, we tend to see, and, and we, just, we just published this actually, it it's, should come out in print in June. Um, if you're successful one year, you're m being you hatch a nest, you're dramatically more likely to be successful next year. If you fail this year, it's almost a certainty you're going to fail next year. And what that, if you think about that big picture, so we're seeing, you know, issues with productivity in our southeastern populations. Not, we're not making as many turkeys as we used to. But what that piece of data tells me is that the, the young birds we are producing are disproportionately produced by a very small segment of the hens in a population. In other words, most of what we're seeing poult-wise is coming from a really small percentage of the hen population year after year after year. So in reality, there very likely are some hens that are just better at their jobs for reasons we can't fully comprehend. They're, they, for whatever reason, they just do things differently and it works. And those are the hens that are making more poults than the other segment of hens. It's really interesting. Like they're super hens, if you will. You know, they're just some good moms mm. out there. Well, that makes recruitment be even more important. No question. Oh, absolutely. What well, came first, the turkey or the egg? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> that speaks I mean, to the importance yeah. of hens. I mean, yeah, it speaks exactly. to the importance of having those hens be as, <clears throat> in the best possible condition they can be yeah. in, to have as many resources as they can have, 
to not deal with poaching and illegal killing, you know, that, that type of thing, and to be able to function as best as possible. Yeah, well, you know, we always, we've talked about brood rearing a lot, but we just assume, you know, that all hens are the same, you know, if they're walking around and they're laying eggs and, yeah. ra and raising clutches, but that's not the fact. Yeah, and back, and what's, what's funny is, so George Hurst was a famous professor at oh, yeah. Mississippi State, yeah. and I worked under George when I started, and, and, um, he, he told me one time, just passing in the hall, George was an interesting guy, just passing in the hall, he's like, you, you'll see that there's just some hens that are just good and some just suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he just kept walking, you know, and this was like 1993, like August of 93 in the hall. <laughs> and he was right. All yeah. these years later, I can prove it. Yeah. He was right. Yeah. There are just some hens some that are just better. Some better mamas than others. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's like people. No different than people. So Mac is over here raising his hand. What, okay, Mac, Mac what, what's, but you, you quit texting, Mac. What is going on? So I've got a question, Dr. Chamberlain. Uh, speaking of nesting, you see a lot of folks kind of getting into trapping and, and starting to trap and learning how to trap. And when I think about trapping, I'm like, okay, I want to try to catch the nest predators. Mm -hmm. So without knowing where a hen nests, without having devices on the hens to track where they're nesting, how would you suggest to a person that's getting into trapping how to hone in on a specific area and you know focus on that area to for predation and for for trapping to kind of be more successful uh without knowing exactly where the hens yeah, you are you don't you don't really need to know where your hens are just worry about where your predators are so if your goal is to trap predators then you have to think like a predator not like a turkey so think about you know, use your, your wood savvy to identify places where you've got sign of whatever it is. So nest predators, raccoons, opossums, skunks, et cetera. If you're talking about adult predators, bobcats, coyotes, et cetera, figure out where they're using and where, they're, where their use is high enough. And more importantly, particularly if you're using foothold traps, is figure out where you can most effectively put that set to catch that animal and don't worry about what the birds are doing. Because those predators are, they're using home ranges that overlap those hens and, and where they're nesting. It's just as effective to catch a raccoon outside of a stand where she's nesting as it is to catch one inside. It's the same raccoon. So I just tell people, think like a, you know, for instance, if you want to catch a coyote, think like a coyote. Mm -hmm. Understand that they have a spacing amongst, when they, when they step, they have a, a gait that's very predictable. It's longer than a bobcat. So design your trapping sets to to try to target the animal that left that sign wherever you see it. That's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that makes sense. Gotta go ahead. So it's pretty obvious everybody thinks raccoons are a pretty major nest predator, possums, things like that. What are some of the more uncommon nest predators? Like the, the first the first one that comes to mind uh, are deer nest predators. I've, I've seen mm -hmm. video of them eating Ooh. little little birds. Yeah. I've seen a video of a deer like eating a sparrow that mm -hmm. he got lucky and mm -hmm. got. Uh, you know, or has anybody done any work on that? Or we we have we we've we've put a lot of cameras at nest. Now understand, you're taking a risk to put a camera at a sure. nest for easterns at least. Rios, they don't care. But Easterns are, are kind of sensitive about, so yes, we have, and we just actually, we just published this as well. You see a lot of overlap in, in nest sites and deer use, but we don't have any evidence to suggest the deer are depredating nests. Okay. Um, the, the atypical ones a lot of people don't think about, snakes would be a, a big one. What about turtles? No. No, I can't ever think of that. Um, snakes, armadillos, believe it or not, bobcats will will readily eat eggs. They don't just kill the adults; they'll they'll, they'll eat the eggs as well. Of course, coyotes and foxes and the, the the critters you mentioned. As you go out in other areas, you know, even coach whips. If you go out in Rio Country, coach whip snakes are a common nest predator, and they eat poults, and so do rat snakes and other species of snakes here. It's a laundry list of stuff that eats a turkey egg, for sure. That turkey's like a little shrimp. Everything in the <laughs> ocean is after him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and you know, and hens are, and, and hens are good at like we've been talking about. Some hens are good at their jobs, and, and you do see that 
for some of these predators, hens will actively defend that nest. You know, they're not going to defend the nest against a bobcat. But if a rat snake comes up there, depending on her attitude and behavior, there's a pretty good chance she'll she'll stay on her ground and just say, no, not happening today. Mm -hmm. You know, not long. I think I've seen some footage of, of turkeys. Yes. Yeah, there was snake. one floating all over social media yeah. of a bird attacking a snake right. that was at near its nest. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that's a... That's a common that's behavior. Cool. She's a good mama. Yeah. <laughs> and I've actually had birds that, that kind of refused to leave their nest when I got too close. I've experienced that in the woods. And, uh, and, and, and in the research world, you never want to do that. You never want to disturb her when we're, you know, when we're trying to, to do work around their nest. But sometimes back in the day, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to approach nest or hens while they're incubating. We've got the GPS to tell us exactly where she's at. But back in the day, like when I was here, I'd have to go track those birds and, and figure out, okay, she's about 30 yards right there, and she's at 210 degrees. You know, so I'd, I'd have to know where that nest was. And sometimes I just didn't do my job as well as I should have, and I'd get too close and I'd bump her. Most of the times they just fly off, but sometimes they didn't. They didn't. They just stood there and were like, "Hey, mm -mm, no, you're, you're not My doing babies. this. Yeah, yeah, not doing it right now." So, you know, I've it, have bumped a few turkeys off nest in the past, and I've always it's kind of it's always amazed me that there were, there's really no structure to the nest. It's maybe mm -hmm. just a little depression it's there in the ground, and she's just she's laid her eggs right there. It's yeah, they don't do a lot of. I mean, it's not like they have this elaborate construction process. They just kind of pick them a spot and there's a shallow depression there and you know usually some feathers and it's just it's pretty pretty simple it's amazing that they pull it off it is so a couple of things we want to ask you while we're, we're going down this road I, I want to give you and i'll let you think about this one and come back to it but is there anything that as you do all these podcasts that you've always wanted to talk about something you've learned about turkeys that nobody ever asked you that question so give you a chance to say something that you've been fascinated by that uh, maybe you don't get to talk about very much and and but while you're thinking about that we'll let you multitask here and we, we want to ask you about as you travel around where do you think <coughs> the toughest turkeys are and have you heard the about the legend of the old mossy headed turkey and do you have any no, thoughts on that no, so. no i haven't but i can if you tell me the story, the old, Lord. yeah um as far as the I think every turkey hunter will say this. The toughest birds to hunt are the ones right in my backyard that I have to hunt, right? Yeah. You know, that's the that's the toughest birds. Um, that's a good point. I, it always seems that's the case to me. When when I talk, it, well, let me back up. Without infuriating people that hunt Rios and Merriams and Goulds, <laughs> um, I think most southeastern folks would say, you know, easterns, are they're, they're tough, particularly on public land, and, and if they're heavily hunted, they're... They're a beast. Um, in my ex the most frustrating experiences I've ever had were on public lands, mid season, where I just could not figure out how to kill this bird, and, and they were just maddening. Just, I mean, unpredictable, wonky, weird things that they would do. And 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 now to your first question, one thing that I don't get asked a lot that people don't believe is that this notion that these birds often don't roost in the same place every night. I get asked this every now and then. And no matter how many times I can show someone a map of two birds doing this behavior, they'd never believe me. But this is, this is the truth based on GPS data. If you hear what you think is the same bird in the same spot two nights in a row, it is more likely you're hearing two different birds. I'm not saying that it's impossible that it's the same bird. We see some birds that go back to the same spot every night. Right. But in a probability standpoint, it's more likely that it's not that same bird. Huh. That's definitely my experience. And then, then I think about all those times back in like 1997 that I got my tail handed to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, yesterday he went east. And he went down that ridge and he... He hooked up and got on the edge of this clear cut, and he booked it north, and, and I'm ready for that the second day. Hell, he flew south the second day, and he went <laughs> this, and he did that, and yeah. I'm like, well, you didn't do any of that yesterday, right. and then I come back the, the third morning, and he's gone. 
Well, it was a different bird. So there's really no way for us to know, though. No, you look at it and they all cross have, but I mean, it's the I same mean, How way. do you know? How would you know? I, I, I think in some either. cases you probably do know. You, yeah. pro- I mean, you, he's got a very distinct gobble or he, something, I, you know, and, I get, and this is why I'm saying this. This is for the people that are hating on me right now for saying <laughs> that. I have been in situations where I felt almost certain that was the same bird based on how he gobbled, when he gobbled, his behavior outside of just what he did once he flew down, but I don't, I don't know for, for sure that it yeah. was. Is there much? Uh, do, you, do you see birds re-roost during the night? Move that fly somewhere else during the night and be a hundred yards away the, the next? Yeah, because I've experienced oh, yeah. that, and I've, it just makes me scratch my head all the time. Yeah, and and what's really cool is turkeys have terrible night vision. They, they have terrible night vision. He's knocking branches down when he's going through. <laughs> so what's he doing? But why is he changing trees? Is something making him change trees? I my assumption is yes that that something happened during the night that caused him to, to move. We we've, we've seen hens actually that ended up four or five hundred yards from where they started out roosting, which is crazy. Like if you think about a turkey flying through the forest at night, it's a long you know, way. Did she actually <laughs> yeah. hop down on the ground and walk? Run, or did she, yeah. I mean, I don't know, but. But yeah, we we do see birds will will move short distances from one spot to the other, and you, I mean, you've seen the same thing I have. I've roosted birds where I know for sure yeah. he was right there because I was I was I had him pinned and just knew I'd be looking yeah. at him. Watched him morning. fly up, and the next morning he's eighty or ninety yards down the ridge. I'm like, well, wait a minute, I know I didn't screw this up. Mm-hmm. I always likened it to, well, yeah, I, I guess I did, or maybe. Maybe he hopped around in the trees and after I left type of thing, and I should have stayed a little later, and now we just see that, no, they just subject to move sometimes. It's a fascinating bird for sure. I, I just love all these discussions because it's uh, there's so much more. With what he's doing, there's so much more research to discuss. Well, in the turkey hunting community too, we've always, especially before the digital age, we've you know, it's almost like lore. You learn from people that turkey hunted for years and what they told you, and it's just really cool seeing some scientific validation of some of the assumptions we've always made in the woods. Well, look, why don't we take a break? I'm pretty sure Mac doesn't have a commercial, but we, we'll do something, and uh, we'll take a break and rehydrate a little bit. We may have a few more questions uh, we can ask Dr. Chamberlain here, and then we'll close this thing out. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you all. Hi right, everybody. Welcome back. Dudley, Here we are. Dudley. He's texting again. Yeah. So Dudley, I'm gonna let you have the last I'm gonna let you have the last question. Look like you had a good one. Okay. Um when I was a, a young man in undergrad, uh my friends and I would, you know, wanna take turkeys to let Dr. Hurst look at. Mm-hmm. Uh and, you know, hope, you know, one spur or I killed one with no spurs or white, you know. So what are some of the coolest oddities you've seen on a wild turkey? I think, I think probably the neatest things I see are just feather abnormalities, just weird. I call them weird, just some type of abnormal color pattern or a lack of barring or a lack of this or an odd white feather. I, in fact, I I get more pictures sent to me about this than anything else. Somebody will kill a bird and say, hey, I'm in Sumter County, Alabama, and here's this bird I just shot this morning. It's got this weird feather on its wing, like a one that just sent me this actually this morning. Uh, just a white feather, just a weird white feather on his secondaries on his wing, just one. Just random. And... I get, I see a lot of that. Legs that don't look the way they're supposed to look. I got a picture the other day of a bird. His legs look like uh, the gray of a northern pintail. Wow. I mean, it was that gray. And he didn't have any caps on one of his spurs. The, the cap was gone, and the spur had this really weird shape to it. It didn't even look like a turkey spur. And his feet didn't look like a turkey's feet. It, and so I asked... You know, this person, I was like, hey, you know, what happened to this bird? Like, did you find him dead? Or I mean, it, no, no, I shot this bird, you know, the other morning. And, well, what else was abnormal about him? Nothing. And so he sent me pictures, you know, like here's his fan, here's his wings, here's that. It was just his legs for whatever reason. 
but they were literally the color of a northern pintail's legs. Hmm. So, I, and I get pictures all the time of you know birds that have a, a weird tail feather or a couple of tail feathers that are different or have mm-hmm. bronze coloration in places, and we see some of that in pockets, you know, from hybridization with domestic birds that were released decades and decades ago. So you, you, it's all over the map, all over the map. All right, well, brace yourself. Lanny's got a question. There's no telling where this will go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think a turkey looked like 10,000 years ago? Ooh. Huh? You like that one, don't you? Yeah. That's or, a tough question. Yeah. I imagine these things all the time when I'm hunting them. Because <laughs> I in my when I'm in the woods, I'm like, I wonder what this place looked like 100 years ago or 1,000 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what was he doing back then? 10,000 years ago, if you were a turkey, boy, you had a different set of challenges yeah. ahead of you. I honestly have no idea. All right. I'd like to think <laughs> that they were, like, bigger and badder. And, yeah, that's you know, what I like, think. You know, maybe they I had mean, spears I'm, instead yeah. of spurs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going completely. They breathe fire when they gobble. <laughs> I'm going AWOL, you know, here. But were some of them carnivores? And, you know, no, they weren't. But, but yeah, I don't have any idea. But hmm. I, my, my mind tells me they were bigger and, and badder. Bigger and badder. Okay, so let me get this back. Ah, here. sorry. <laughs> well, get us back between the lines. So, here. when you know, I follow you on, on social media and read everything you, you publish, and I'm fascinated by it. But it looks like when you talk about aging a turkey, you really rile up a lot of people. <laughs> you the, think? When, when you talk about spurs and spur <laughs> yeah. length. Because yeah. I think people through for generations have... Just thought they could look at a turkey and say, that's a three-year-old. Yeah. Oh, no, we've done it forever. That, you know? That's one of the most controversial, polarizing topics that I get asked about. And, and, and I can only say this so many times. What we know about what you've read in textbooks about spur length from year, from, for many years came about from early researchers essentially looking at birds and saying, that's a jake. So it has a spur that looks like this. These pictures that we saw in our textbooks back in college. And here's a two-year-old bird. It's about this long. And here's a three-year-old bird. and It's about this long. And since spurs are supposed to grow continuously through their life up to some point, you should be able to look at a bird that, say, is an inch and a quarter. And if the textbook said that's a, a one inch was three-year-old, then that's got to be a four-year-old. And then that's got to be a five-year-old. And that's got to, you know, et cetera. But in reality, that's not truth. Research has clearly shown that even when you radiograph spurs, the, 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 the kind of core of the spur, get that sheath off there and just look at the bony core, there's about a 25% chance you're wrong at distinguishing a two from a three-year-old or mm-hmm. vice versa. And we banned birds. We've banned thousands and thousands of birds all over the southeast, Rios and Easterns. And we have this data set that we are actually writing up the work on it now where we banded jakes. And that's really the only way you can you – know, you catch a bird in hand, you age him based on the barring on his primary feathers, you look at his tail fan, and we know there's some biases there, but – this is definitely a juvenile bird. He weighs 10 pounds, et cetera. We let him go. And then five years later, he's shot by somebody. And when you look at how long his spurs were when he was harvested, there is no pattern hmm. from one age class to the next. You're, you're as likely, yes, most two-year-old birds have a certain length spur, but a lot of them don't. Yes, most three-year-olds have about this length spur, but not all do. So this notion that you could just look at a bird on the ground and say, well, it's an inch spur, he's three-year-old. We've had six- and seven-year-olds shot that had an inch spur. Now, we've had two-year-olds that had inch and a quarter spurs that we know were two years old. In fact, I banded poults here in Mississippi that were harvested. So I, it, I couldn't, I mean, yeah, it's a exactly rooster. Right. I put a little poult leg band on those birds, and they were shot two years later and that inch and a quarter spurs. So mm-hmm. I tell people, if, if you're willing to be wrong a certain percentage of the time, let's say 25% of the time, if you're willing to be wrong, then go for it. 
My ultimate answer is always sure. Every time, I'm <laughs> always that's the every damn thing for yeah. me. Fifty percent of the time, I'm You're right. right every every time. Time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the spur length debate, and people get people get really fussy about it. And I guess maybe I'm maybe I look at this from a different perspective. I don't care. I honestly don't care. I have, and this is a God's honest truth. I've never cared. I've never cared how long the spurs were. Do I measure them? Yeah. Yeah. Do I measure the beard? Yeah. Do I care? I I don't give a rip one way or the other. I'm a turkey hunter. So I mean, I'm a, like I'm a duck hunter. You want that gobble? You <laughs> yeah. want that gobble? Yeah. yeah. I want, I want, I want the show. Yeah. You know, I, I want, want the, the show. Yeah, I want the experience. Yeah. And if he ends up, I, I'll never forget this. A couple of years ago, I was, I was hunting Merriam's with two buddies, and this bird was. I mean, he was doing his show. He was doing his thing, and he ended up with a half inch spurs. And one of my buddies commented. He goes, well, "That's kind of a letdown." Shot my head over him. I said, after what you just saw, that's a letdown? Yeah, for real. I don't care how long his spurs were. I don't care if he doesn't have spurs. Man, he put on a show, and that's what I'm here for. And I'm going to lie about him anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So in reality, he had half inch, but I told everybody they were inch, you know, they were inch yeah, married. Oh, right. sure. Yeah. I clearly understand that. Yeah. Y'all smell those, that, those turkey leg enchiladas man he's cooking back there? You got the gamekeeper kitchen fired up. Oh, is that lunch? That is lunch. We're gonna have turkey leg uh, enchiladas with a wild boar chorizo dip, cheese dip. Nice. Huh? Well, sounds good. Nice. Sounds good. So, are you a fan of turkey legs? I am. I actually, I think it's a travesty not to. Not oh, to they're use wonderful. Them. There you go. Yeah, I like. I, I Cajun inject mine and season them up real good and braise them down and pull all the meat off and make tacos mm-hmm. and enchiladas. It's delicious. It's delicious. Yeah. And the soups. stock is good. Yeah. yeah. Stock's yeah. really good too. So yeah. anyways, that's smelling good. Let's get on in there and get some of it, I guess, Bobby. You look yeah. over stunned. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm excited. Well, Mike, we have, uh, we look, we've enjoyed having you here and uh, we're big fans of what you do as gamekeepers. What you're doing and what you're talking about and what you're preaching is just dead center of our bullseye. We really... Uh, we're proud of what you're doing, and we want to help any way we can get get any messages out that you've got. So, so we, I appreciate it. Yeah, keep Definitely. that in mind. So, it, it, before we let you go, is there is there one little tip you could give a turkey hunter that's listening to this? Uh, be, you know that you've learned through your research that they may not have thought about, or you know, like maybe subscribe to Gamekeepers. Or, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's nice. shameless plug there. Yeah, yeah. Subscribe. Drink to more Ovaltine. Yeah. Yeah. Drink more Ovaltine. Yeah, drink more Ovaltine. That, yeah, there you go. Yeah, the shameless plug. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you don't have to answer that. So, but look, we have in Georgia, and we've got some stuff lined up to, that'll be coming out in the next few months. So uh, that that'll have more of you on there. And we're we're uh, we're we're hoping people want to hear more from you. So. I hope. So. I know I do. I so. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks so much for being here. We Thank appreciate you guys. it. Appreciate it. All right. Well, say goodbye, Dudley. Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Cleve. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.